we be continue our study in regard to that pot of manna, and especially as we apply it to our own time, I would like us to turn our attention to the future, to the time when we're going to be in that heavenly Canaan, the new heaven and the new earth. I would like to read from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of the heavens saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these are true and faithful. Just a few thoughts about that heavenly Canaan that God has prepared for us. But in order for us to enter that heavenly Canaan, God wants us to have a special experience. We need to learn from the example of the children of Israel. Now there are many examples that we can learn from the children of Israel. And we've only covered one particular point and in this particular study we are emphasizing the point in regards to diet there are many other points but please let us not forget the diet is one of those points and so as we continue our study I want us to understand what is it that we can learn from this what does God want us to experience as a people in regards to our diet now pot of manna was placed in the ark. That's where it was placed. And in 1844, we as the children of, uh, of Israel in modern times, we also have left Egypt. Therefore, do we have an ark that God has for us? Well, let's take a look in early writings. In the book, Early Writings, page 32, I would like to read a vision that the prophet had. Early Writings, page 32. This was a vision that she received in the year 1847. 1847 in Topsom, Maine. It says, In the holiest I saw an ark. On the top and sides of it was pure as gold. On each end of the ark was a lovely cherub with its wings spread over. Their faces were turned towards each other and they looked downward. Between the angels was a golden censer. Above the ark where the angels stood was an exceeding bright glory that appeared like the throne where God dwelt. Jesus stood by the ark and as the saints' prayers came up to him, the incense and the censer would smoke and he would offer up their prayers with the smoke of the incense. In the ark was the golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of stone which folded together like a book. It was in the ark. What was in the ark that she saw in 1847, soon after the children of Israel, modern Israel I'm talking about, left Egypt in 1844? In the ark was the pot of manna, Aaron's rod, and the tables of stone. So then, what does that manna mean for us today? What does the pot of manna represent for us? In the book, Councils on Diet and Foods, page 269, Councils on Diet and Foods, 269, I read the following. I must now give to my brethren the instruction that the Lord has given me in regard to the health food question. By many, the health foods are looked upon as of man's devising, but they are God's originating as a blessing to His people. The health food work is the property of God and is not to be made a financial speculation for personal gain. The light that God has given and will continue to give on the food question is to be to His people today what the manna was to the children of Israel. So the whole issue of health foods 
obviously including our diet. The whole issue of health foods today is what the manna was to the children of Israel. So what does God want us as a people to have as an Advent people, as His people in these last days? He wants us to have manna. We are in the wilderness, and being in the wilderness, we must live on a non-flesh diet. In our next study, we're going to go especially a little bit deeper into this aspect. Why did God give them a non-flesh diet in their day? And why does God expect us to do the same? But let us continue here. When we as people who hear the message of truth in these last days, what happens to us? What do we realize when that truth comes to us? Council on Diet and Foods 268. Councils on Diet and Foods 268. When the message comes to those who have not heard the truth for this time, they see that a great reformation must take place in their diet. What is to take place? What is to take place when in our days we see when the truth comes to us that a great reformation must take place in our diet? That's right. So diet obviously is a part of the message that we have to present to the world. They see that they must put away flesh foods because it creates an appetite for liquor and fills the system with disease. By meat eating, the physical, mental, and moral powers are weakened. Notice here, what happens when we eat flesh foods? What happens to us? It does a weakening process. What does it weaken? Physical, mental, and moral. So, what does it do to us? It weakens our physical power, our mental power, and our moral power. And I have a question for you. Do you think that you can afford to be weaker in these three areas as you are trying to conquer and be a victorious in this Christian life? We need all the advantages that we can have, and this is why God has given to us the plan of vegetarianism. That's why God has given us the pot of manna. <clears throat> In Volume 1, Testament for the Church, 488 to 489. Volume 1, 488 to 489. There are but few as yet who are aroused sufficiently to understand how much their habits of diet have to do with their health, their characters, their usefulness in this world, and their eternal destiny. Again, a couple more points we need to add up here. Our habits of eating have to do with what? Number one, it mentions here our health, and we all know that. We, we recognize that. Number two, with our character. What you do in your character is determined by your diet. Also, our usefulness. In this world. If you are sick, how useful can you be? It is impossible. God wants us to have the optimum of health. And number four, our eternal destiny. So, our habits of eating or diet. Our habits of diet have to do with our health, our characters, and our usefulness in this world, and our eternal destiny. I saw that it is, a, it is the duty of those who have received the light from heaven and have realized the benefit of walking in it to manifest a greater interest for those who are still suffering for want of knowledge. 
Sabbath keepers who are looking for the soon appearing of their Savior should be the last to manifest a lack of interest in this great work of reform. Men and women must be instructed, and ministers and people should feel that the burden of the work rests upon them to agitate the subject and to urge it home upon others. What is our responsibility in regard to health reform on the health message? Is it to take it very calmly? No, no, no. It says here what? We are to agitate the subject of health. And we are not only to agitate it, but we are also to urge others to adopt the proper health. That's what God expects from us. And this is why God has placed the pot of manna in our ark. You see in 1844 what happened in Revelation chapter 11, verses 18 and 19. Revelation 11, verses 18 and 19. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Here we find the time that the nation should be judged. And after the judgment, there is a time for the giving of the reward. Now, this reward we're talking is mentioned here in Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22 mentions the reward that we are to receive and when we receive this reward. Revelation chapter 22, and we look at verse 12. Revelation 22 and verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. What does that mean? When Jesus comes, we receive the reward. So when we look at the timeline of events taking place, we find that here you have the second coming of Christ. It is at this time when He comes that we receive the reward. But according to Revelation 11, prior to the giving of the reward, there is something else. It is called a judgment. So this judgment must happen prior to the second coming of Christ. So first the judgment, then and only then the giving of the reward. Now in order for the judgment to take place properly, what was revealed? Let's go back to Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19 now. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in His temple the ark of His testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunders and a great earthquake and great hail. So what happened? When it was time for the judgment to be revealed, then what happened? Then the ark was revealed to God's people. And of course, what is in that ark? We read, let's read it again in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Let us see what was in that ark. Hebrews 9, verse 3 and 4, And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. So inside that ark was what? The pot of manna, Aaron's rod, and the tables of the covenant, which is the Ten Commandments. So, when the judgment was opened, these points were revealed to God's people. And we know that this judgment, prior to the second coming of Christ, is speaking about the investigative judgment, and by our other studies we've known, and we as Adventists know, that it was 1844 that that judgment began. So, after 1844, the ark was revealed, and these three items are in the ark. Therefore, those people who are waiting for the coming of Christ are going to be judged by those things inside that ark. By the pot of manna, by Aaron's rod, and by the tables of the covenant, which are the Ten Commandments. 
For this reason, in early writings, again, page 32, in the ark, not by the side of the ark or anything else, in the ark was the golden pot of manna, Aaron's rather budded, and a table of stone which folded together like a book. Now, although these things are very clear, God gave the ark to His people, and if you remember from our previous study, we have learned very clearly that those people who are going to the promised land, what must they do? What is between us and the promised land? There's something there. What is there? There is here called that river. The Jordan River. And how are we going to cross that river? How are Israel crossing that river? They crossed it by following the ark. We today, the only way we're going to enter into that promised land, we also must follow that ark to our Jordan River. So now, if we're going to follow that ark, it's not to follow the ark, meaning let's find some chest so we can go carry something on our shoulders. <laughs> no, no. The children of Israel, they tried to do that sometimes. They even looked at the temple. They worshipped the temple. They had something wonderful for themselves to look at. What about the time of Hophni and Phinez? You remember that story? They ran out there with the ark on their shoulders. They said, we have the ark. But they were not living in accordance to what was inside that ark. And because they were not living in accordance to what was inside that ark, what happened? With that ark on their shoulders, the Philistine army came, killed them, the two priests, Hophni and Phinehas, and they captured the ark. That's what it was worth. It was worth nothing. And so unless we are living according to the items inside that ark, we are not going, we are not the people that are bearing that ark. Now, there is a problem, though. In volume 5, page 77, volume 5, page 77, talks about a prophecy, a danger that is to take place among the Advent people. Volume 5, page 77. It says, The patience of God has an object, but you are defeating it. He is allowing a state of things to come that you would fain see counteracted by and by, but it will be too late. God commanded Elijah to anoint the cruel and deceitful Hazael king over Syria, that he might be a scourge to idolatrous Israel. Who knows whether God will not give you up to the deceptions you love? Who knows but that the preachers who are faithful, firm, and true may be the last who shall offer the gospel of peace to our unthankful churches? It may be that the destroyers are already training under the hand of Satan and only wait the departure of a few more standard bearers to take their places. And with the voice of the false prophet, cry peace peace when the Lord had not spoken peace I seldom weep but now I find my eyes blinded with tears they are falling upon my paper as I write it may be that ere long all prophesying among us will be at an end and the voice which has stirred a people may no longer disturb their carnal slumbers what happened when Elijah the prophet came to the people he anointed cruel and deceitful Haziel to do what? To destroy the children of Israel. And who knows that that is not going to take place now, it says here. Who knows that in our churches, and this is talking about we as Seventh-day Adventists, who knows but that in our churches the false torch of false prophecy may come in there. And as a result, as she looked at that whole thing, she began to weep. Because people now, instead of giving the torch of truth, they gave the torch of peace and safety. And then it goes on. When God shall work His strange work on earth, when holy hands bear the ark no longer, woe will be upon the people. Yes, they were a people. God in 1844 called out a people to bear that ark. Called out a people to take us to the promised land. That we can follow that ark. And we can go up and possess the land. But what happens when holy hands bear the ark no longer? Then what shall we do? How shall we cross the river? How shall we enter our eternal reward? How shall we go to the promised land if holy hands bear the ark no longer? What can we do? There was no other way across the Jordan River but 
to follow the ark. What shall we do then as the modern Israel in these last days? You know, God never gives us a warning and leaves us to hang. God never gives a message of condemnation and leaves us alone. Oh no, our God is not that type of a God. The type of God that we worship, what does He do? He gives us a message of warning, but He also shows a way of hope. And in Testimonies of Ministers, page 411, Testimonies of Ministers, page 411, it gives us that hope about that ark. And what does it say? It says, Satan has laid every measure possible that nothing shall come among us as a people to reprove and rebuke us and exhort us to put away our errors. But there is a people who will bear the ark of God. Some will go out from among us who will bear the ark no longer, but these cannot make walls to obstruct the truth, for it will go onward and upward to the end. Brethren, this is a message of hope. It says here that yes, there may be a people that received that ark in the beginning. And in volume 5, page 77, yes, they refuse to bear the ark. They bear the ark no longer. Woe will be upon the people. But remember something. There will always be a people. Not merely individuals here and there, but there always will be a people that will bear that ark. Uh, who are that people? It's quite simple. It's not very difficult to find out who that people are that bear the ark. All you have to do is look which people on this earth bear that have the pot of manna. As a people, not just as individuals, but as a people. Who are that people that have the pot of manna? And then once we understand in our next few, in a few studies in the future here, when we understand Aaron's rod, well, who are the people that have that? And then as we study the Ten Commandments, who are the people that have that? Those are the people that bear the ark. Not those that say, oh, we bear the ark. No, that's not enough. We must have the characteristics that are found in that ark in order to really be the people of the ark. Let me read that statement again. Testimony of the Ministers, page 411. Satan has laid every measure possible that nothing shall come among us as a people to reprove and rebuke us and exhort us to put away our errors. But there is a people who will bear the ark of God. If we are to be the people to bear the ark in regard to the pot of manna, what? should we do as a people in regards to the use of flesh foods? And again, I want to emphasize, we are limiting this study only on one point. I know there are many other topics, but let's limit it to this one particular point. Medical Ministry 278 to 279. Medical Ministry 278 to 279. It has been clearly presented to me that God's people are to take a firm stand against meat eating. What? Let me read it again. It has been clearly presented to me that God's people are to take a firm stand against meat eating. That's right. That, and that was written back in 1902. We are approaching a hundred years for that statement. Would God for 30 years, now that back, back in those days, would God for 30 years give His people the message that if they, should, if they desire to have pure blood and clear minds, they must give up the use of flesh meats if He did not want them to heed this message? By the use of flesh meat, the animal nature is strengthened and the spiritual nature weakened. What nature do you want? Are you partaking of the divine nature? And tell me something. How much animalistic character is there in God's nature? In the divine nature? Well, if it says here, if we eat flesh food, we are strengthening the animal and lessening the spiritual nature. You may wonder why you may be having a difficult time overcoming the things of this world. Well, we're going to have a difficult time no matter what we do. But, 
how much more difficulty we place upon ourselves when we strengthen our animal nature. Again in 1902 we find in Medical Ministry, page 274. Medical Ministry, page 274. Concerning flesh meats, we can all say, let it alone. To do what? What are we to do with it? Concerning flesh meat, we can all say, let it alone. And all should bear a clear testimony against tea and coffee, never using them. Just to add on to this flesh issue, how often are we to use tea and coffee? Never using them. They are narcotics, injurious alike to the brain and to uh, the other organs of the body. The time has not yet come when I can say that the use of milk and of eggs should be wholly discontinued. Milk and eggs should not be classed with flesh meat. In some ailments, the use of eggs is very beneficial. The time has not yet come. When was this written? 1902. Has the time come now? Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 119. Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 119. And this was written in the year 1890. 1890. Again and again I have been shown that God is trying to lead us back step by step to His original design, that man should subsist upon the natural products of the earth. Among those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord, meat eating will eventually be done away. Flesh will cease to form a part of their diet. So those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord. Are you waiting for the coming of the Lord? If you are, then meat eating will eventually be done away. Flesh will cease to form a part of your diet. Is Jesus coming soon? We often say, yes, we believe Jesus is coming soon. We believe these things are to take place, but in the future. We put it so far in the future. And I have a question. Is Jesus coming soon? Do you believe that Jesus is coming soon or you don't believe Jesus is coming soon? If Jesus is coming soon, then what will you do? Then you must give up the use of flesh foods. Medical Ministry, page 317. Medical Ministry, 317. Is it not time that all should aim to dispense with flesh foods? How can those who are seeking to become pure, refined, and holy, that they may have the companionship of heavenly angels, continue to use as food anything that has so harmful an effect on soul and body. On what? On soul and body. It's affecting your soul. How can it take the life of God's creatures that they may consume the flesh as a luxury? Let them rather return to the wholesome and delicious food given to man in the beginning and themselves practice and teach their children to practice mercy towards the dumb creatures that God has made and has placed under our dominion. All this is very important. But where should this reformation begin? Where should the reformation in regard to diet be, take its beginning place? Volume 1, page 469 to 470. Volume 1, 469 to 470. The ministers must be converted before they can strengthen their brethren. They should not preach themselves, but Christ in His righteousness. A reformation is needed among the people, but it should first begin its purifying work with the ministers. So when we talk about reformation, when we talk about the progress in dietary reform, where must that begin? It says clearly it must begin among the ministers. It goes on. One important part of the work of the ministry is to faithfully present to the people the health reform as it stands connected with the third angel's message as part and parcel of the same work. In other words, it is the same package. The third angel's message and the health message are in the same package. You cannot say, oh, I, I don't want the health work. I'm only preaching the third angel's message. No, no. If we are not teaching the health message, then we are not teaching the third angel's message. 
they must be combined together because they are together. They are one message. One important part of the work of the ministry is to faithfully present to the people the health reform as it stands connected with the third angel's message as part and parcel of the same work. They should not fail to adopt it themselves and should urge it upon all who profess to believe the truth. What is the responsibility of the ministry? Not only to accept the message for themselves, but what else? To urge this message to, the, to others. Now, what about, this is again going back to the year 1900. This is going almost a hundred years ago. What was to happen to those who knew the message but refused to adopt it? Let us read volume 6, page 374 to 375. Volume 6, 374 to 375. Only those who appreciate these principles, speaking about health reform, only those who appreciate these principles and have been trained to care for their bodies intelligently and in the fear of God should be chosen to take responsibilities in this work. Those who have been long in the truth, yet who cannot distinguish between the pure principles of righteousness and the principles of evil, whose understanding in regard to justice, mercy, and the love of God is clouded, should be relieved of responsibilities. Should be what? Relieved. Every church needs a clear, sharp testimony giving the trumpet a certain sound. Every church is in need of a clear message, a clear presentation of these subjects. And why is it important for us to give a clear message? Beginning with the ministry. Why? Ministry of Healing, page 312. Ministry of Healing, page 312. By departing from the plan divinely appointed for their diet, the Israelites suffered great loss. They desired a flesh diet, and they reaped its results. They did not reach God's ideal of character or fulfill His purpose. What happened? As a people, they never reached God's ideal of character. And they never fulfilled His purpose. Why is that? Let's look at Psalms 106 verse 15. Psalm 106 and verse 15. Why is it that they were not able to reach that ideal of character? Verses 14 and 15. Psalm 106, 14 and 15 but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert and he gave them their request but sent leanness into their soul. What happened? What happened as a result? Well, God gave them their desires. They insisted on meat. God gave it to them. But spiritually there was a loss. They were weakened spiritually. I don't know if that's what you desire. I don't. Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene 118 to 119. Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene 118 to 119. Had they been willing to deny appetite in obedience to his restrictions, feebleness and disease would have been unknown among them. Let's read that statement once again in Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15 verse 26 you remember that from our last study and said if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians for I am the Lord that he let thee what will happen I will put none of these diseases it says here, Had they been willing to deny appetite in obedience to his restrictions, feebleness and disease would have been unknown among them. They would have no idea. Disease? What is that? Sickness? Never heard of it. Didn't experience it ourselves. Not in the coasts of Israel. Their descendants would have possessed physical and mental strength. They would have had clear perceptions of truth and duty. Clearly they would understand what is, respond, what is the truth. Clearly they would understand their responsibility towards that truth. They would have had clear perception of truth and duty, keen discrimination and sound judgment. 
to be able to determine what is right and what is wrong. But they were but they were unwilling to submit to God's requirements and they failed to reach the standard He has set for them. They failed to reach that standard because of their choice in regard to their diet. Because they lost the pot of manna. They failed to reach the standard He has set for them and to receive the blessings that might have been theirs. They murmured at God's restrictions and lusted after the flesh pots of Egypt. God gave them flesh but it proved a curse to them. What does God want from His church? What does God want from us as a people? When Jesus comes again, what kind of a church is He going to find? Let's look at Ephesians. Paul's letter to the Ephesian church made it very clear what God is going to have when he comes again. Ephesians 5 and verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. God's going to have a church that is holy and without blemish. Now, can we attain the Christian perfection if we indulge our appetite? Is that possible? Volume 2, Testing for the Church, page 400. Volume 2, Testing for the Church, page 400. It is impossible. And before we go on, what do you understand by impossible? Is there a way around it? No. Impossible means it cannot be done. It is impossible for those who indulge the appetite to attain to Christian perfection. That's right. So if we reject the whole issue of dietary reform, if we reject the pot of manna, what will happen? Soon, very quickly, perfection must be obliterated out of our thoughts. And this is what happens. This is why we hear the idea today, oh, you cannot be perfect. Why? Because we have rejected the pot of manna. And therefore, Christian perfection is an impossibility. For this reason, because dietary reform is so important. What about the ministry? Reformation must begin where? Among the ministers. And for this reason, what was to happen after 1900? Volume 6, page 378. Volume 6, Testing for the Church, page 378. Why do some of our ministering brethren manifest a little interest in health reform? It is because instruction on temperance in all things is opposed to their practice of self-indulgence. In some places, this has been the great stumbling block in the way of our bringing the people to investigate and practice and teach health reform. The biggest stumbling block was the ministers. It goes on. No man should be set apart as a teacher of the people while their own teaching or example contradicts the testimony God has given His servants to bear in regard to diet. For this will bring confusion. What does it bring in? It brings in confusion in the church. So, from the year 1900, no one should be set apart as a teacher whose teachings do what? Conflict with the message of health reform. It goes on. His disregard of health reform unfits him to stand as the Lord's messenger. So, if we as ministers are disregarding the principles of health reform, we are not fit to stand before the people. That's a serious message. Again, 100 years ago, what about today? Again, Ministry of Healing, page 315. Ministry of Healing, page 315. The moral evils of a flesh diet are not less marked than are the physical ills. Flesh food is injurious to health, and whatever affects the body has a corresponding effect on the mind and the soul. So whatever is affecting our body, it affects our mind, it affects our soul. Can you afford that? Can you afford that weakness upon your soul? 
Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 47. Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 47. Those who use flesh meats freely do not always have an unclouded brain and an active intellect because the use of the flesh of animals tends to cause a grossness of body and to benumb the finer sensibilities of the mind. Whenever there are issues that come that you have to finally determine between right and wrong, those who use flesh cannot determine between that. Many of us have read about the beautiful Garden of Eden. How wonderful it was right there in the very beginning. Pure, uh, just a place for all of us to be. Do you want to be there? Do you want to have a place in the Garden of Eden? Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 54, paragraph 2. Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 54, paragraph 2. Adam fell by the indulgence of appetite. Christ overcame by the denial of appetite. And our only hope of regaining Eden is through firm self-control. Notice here, our only hope of regaining Eden is through firm self-control. You want to be there? I want to be there. Brethren, let us go up and possess the land. Medical Ministry 277 278. Medical Ministry 277 278. We are composed of what we eat, and eating much flesh will diminish intellectual activity. Students would accomplish much more in their studies if they never tasted meat. When the animal part of the human agent is strengthened by meat eating, the intellectual powers diminish proportionately. A religious life can be more successfully gained and maintained if meat is discarded. For this diet stimulates into intense activities lustful propensities and enfeebles the moral and spiritual nature. Again, this is why it's so important for the ministry to take the first step. Why is that? Volume 2, Testing for the Church, 645. Volume 2, 645. The people will seldom rise higher than their minister. Yes. The people will seldom rise higher than their minister. So if we want a reformation in health reform, it must begin with a ministry. Volume 9, 159 to 160. Volume 9, 159 to 160. Will any who are ministers of the gospel proclaiming the most solemn truth ever given to mortals set an example in returning to the flesh pots of Egypt? Is that what we want, to go back to Egypt? Well, if a minister is still eating meat, he's not going to the promised land. No, no. he is doing what? He is going back towards Egypt. That's where he's headed. So, Will any who are ministers of the gospel proclaiming the most solemn truth ever given to mortals set an example in returning to the flesh pots of Egypt? Will those who are supported by the tithe from God's storehouse permit themselves by self-indulgence to poison the life-giving current flowing through their veins? Is that what they want to do? Down further. The brain and nerves are in sympathy with the stomach. And listen to this now. Erroneous eating and drinking result in erroneous thinking and acting. What is it? Erroneous eating and drinking result in what? Erroneous thinking and acting. That's the natural result. We often talk about the purification of God's people. Oh, we want the people of God to be purified. We pray for this purification. Well, what is one of the things that God is using and is going to use? Is using and is going to use 
to purify his church, to purify his people. What is he going to use? Councils on Diet and Foods, page 38. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 38. Beware how you place yourself in opposition to the work of health reform. It will go forward, for it is the Lord's means of lessening the suffering in our world and of purifying His people. Two things. Health reform does. What is it? First of all, it lessens the suffering in the world. And secondly, it purifies the people. So when we're talking about the purification of the people of God, and then we hinder the message of health reform, what are we doing? We're actually trying to stop the purification. But no, we must allow the purification process to go forward. Now, how do we make this change? Because I know in some of you that are listening, some of you have been vegetarians already, some of you have already accepted this message, and praise the Lord for that. You have already have an advantage. But those of you who have not, and keep in mind, even those of us who are vegetarians, health reform is to be progressive. So what should we do? Volume 6, page 371. Volume 6, page 371. Let all examine their own practices to see if they are not indulging in that which is a positive injury to them. So number one, what should we do? We need to keep this point here. Number one, examine our cells. This does not mean me to examine you. That is not the plan of God, no. The plan of God is number one, you and I must examine our cells. See, it's much easier for me to examine you. But that's not what God said. God said in the first place, I must examine myself. You must examine yourself. And examine for what? Let it all examine their own practices to see if they are not indulging in that which is a positive injury to them. Let them dispense with every unhealthful gratification in eating and drinking. Some go to distant countries to seek a better climate. But wherever they may be, the stomach creates for them a malarious atmosphere. They bring upon themselves suffering that no one can alleviate. Let them bring their daily practices into harmony with nature's laws, and by doing as well as believing, an atmosphere may be created about both soul and body that will be a savior of life unto life. But that's not enough. Examining ourselves is the first step. But there is something else. Medical Ministry 273. Medical Ministry 273. Those who after seeing their mistakes have courage to change their habits will find that the reformatory process requires a struggle and much perseverance. So, after we examine ourselves, of course we must make a decision. We must make a decision. And after we make that decision, we must understand there's gonna, it, it, this decision is going to involve something. What is it going to involve? A struggle and much perseverance. So, that is what is going to be required of us. But when correct tastes are formed, they will realize that the use of food, which they have formerly regarded as harmless, was slowly but surely laying the foundation for dyspepsia and other diseases. Now, sometimes it's very difficult, even with all of this, to give up bad habits. So what should we do? Medical Ministry 282, 283. Medical Ministry 282. 283. Persons who have indulged their appetite to eat freely of meat, highly seasoned gravies and various kinds of rich cakes and preserves cannot immediately relish a plain, wholesome and nutritious diet. They cannot do that. Their taste is so perverted that they have no appetite for a wholesome diet of fruits, plain bread and vegetables. They need not expect to relish at first 
food so different from that which they have been indulging themselves to eat. If they cannot at first enjoy plain food, so if you're finding yourself a problem, I cannot enjoy this plain food. There is a solution. There is a really good solution here. And what is the inspired solution? If they cannot at first enjoy plain food, they should fast until they can. That's right. If you cannot do it any other way, what should we do? Then we go down to number four, then fast and pray. That's right. Fast and pray. You cannot enjoy good food, good, simple, wholesome food, then fast until you can. Because when you are hungry, you will enjoy that food. It goes on that fast will prove to them of greater benefit than medicine, for the abused stomach will find that rest which it has long needed, and real hunger can be satisfied with a plain diet. When a child comes to me and says, oh, I can't eat this, when it's good nourishing food, then that child is overfed. That's very simple. And the same thing with us as adults. All we have to do, skip a meal or two, maybe three or four, it's not going to hurt us. Our stomach will have a rest, and when it's time to eat the good nourishing food, it will be delicious, guaranteed. The next paragraph, whenever I have seen children feeding upon flesh meat, since the light was given me from heaven, I have felt that if the parents only knew what they were doing, they would fast and pray for moral courage and God-given wisdom and grace to do right. Sometimes we have to fast and pray so we can have that moral courage to do what is right. Next paragraph, for certain things fasting and prayer are recommended and appropriate. In the hand of God, they are a means of cleansing the heart and promoting a receptive frame of mind. So what's the purpose of fasting? First of all, it is God's means of cleansing the heart and to promote a receptive frame of mind. We obtain answers to our prayers because we humble our souls before God. If our appetites clamor for the flesh of dead animals, it is necessary to fast and pray for the Lord to give His grace to deny fleshly lust which war against the soul. There are some general principles that God has given to us in Ministry of Healing 316 and 317. Ministry of Healing 316 and 317. What man with a human heart who has ever cared for domestic animals could look into their eyes so full of confidence and affection and willingly give them over to the butcher's knife how could he devour their flesh as a sweet morsel? How is that possible? It is a mistake to suppose that muscular strength depends on the use of animal food. The needs of the system can be better supplied and more vigorous health can be enjoyed without its use. The grains with fruits, nuts and vegetables contain all the nutritive properties necessary to make good blood. What has enough properties to make good blood? Grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables, that's all we need. These elements are not so well or so fully supplied by a flesh diet. Had the use of flesh been essential to health and strength, animal food would have been included in the diet appointed man in the beginning. When the use of flesh food is discontinued, there is often a sense of weakness, a lack of vigor. Many use this as evidence that flesh food is essential, but it is because foods of this class are stimulating, because they fever the blood and excite the nerves that they are so missed. Some will find it as difficult to leave off flesh eating as it is for the drunkard to give up his dram, but they will be the better for the change. Some people can give up flesh very easily, and others are addicted to it like a drunkard. When flesh is discarded, its place should be supplied with a variety of grains, nuts, vegetables, and fruits that will be both nourishing and appetizing. In other words, we must replace those things. This is especially necessary in the case of those who are weak or who are taxed with continuous labor. In some countries where poverty abounds, flesh is the cheapest food. 
under these circumstances, the change will be made with greater difficulty, but it can be affected. So what about those countries where the cheapest food is flesh? It may be difficult, but it can be done. We should, however, consider the situation of the people and power of lifelong habit and should be careful not to urge even right ideas unduly. None should be urged to make the change abruptly. The place of meat should be supplied with wholesome foods that are inexpensive. And this is a key. It is not to teach people some elaborate uh, preparations that are very expensive that you can only buy in a health food store. No, no, no. We need to be able to educate people to live on a vegetarian diet inexpensively. The place of meat should be supplied with wholesome food that are inexpensive. In this matter, very much depends on the cook. With care and skill, dishes may be prepared that will be both nutritious and appetizing and will to a great degree take the place of flesh meats. Oftentimes I find that someone prepares a health food dish, but it is unappetizing and no one wants to eat it. That's not the secret here. We must make dishes that are helpful and that are appetizing. In all cases, educate the conscience. Enlist the will, supply good wholesome food, and the change will be readily made and the demand for flesh will soon cease. So here, what should we be doing? As we're, we should first of all educate. Educate the people. Educate the conscience. Educate the conscience. Educate the people's willpower so that they want to do this. Then do what? Supply good, wholesome food. And when people see good, wholesome food, they want to be vegetarians. I remember somebody coming to our camp meeting one time and saying, Wow, if this is what vegetarian means, I can be a vegetarian anytime. And he made a change and became a vegetarian. So we must be able to make good wholesome food that is appetizing, that looks like you want to eat it, and that is also nutritious. For this reason, what do we mean when we say health reform? What is true temperance? Patriarchs and Prophets, page 562. Patriarchs and Prophets, 562. True temperance teaches us to dispense entirely with everything hurtful and to use judiciously that which is healthful. So what should we do? What is true temperance? Entirely eliminate those things which are no good. It does not mean everything in moderation. No everything good in moderation and eliminate all that which is unhealthful. There are few who realize as they should how much their habits of diet have to do with their health, their character, their usefulness in this world and their eternal destiny. Now what foods should we use? We mentioned already in a few of the passages fruits, nuts, grains and vegetables and I will not read these over again at this time but we've read those. But we need to be careful. In Medical Ministry 274, Medical Ministry 274, we need to be very careful because oftentimes we think, oh, we need protein, and we fill our diet up with nuts. Careful attention should be given to the proper use of nut foods. Some kind of nuts are not so wholesome as others. Do not reduce the bill of fare to a few articles composed largely of nut foods. So do not rely heavily on that. We need to be balanced in our foods. Next paragraph. Let us make intelligent advancement in simplifying our diet. In the providence of God, every country produces articles of food containing the nourishment necessary for the upbuilding of the system. Now, this is a wonderful God that we serve. Yes, every country is different and I, I travel from place to place. There are some items you can get in this country that you cannot get in other places but they have other items and we need to learn what those items are in each country. Next paragraph. 
Let those who advocate health reform strive earnestly to make it all they claim it is. Let them discard everything detrimental to health. Use simple, wholesome food. Fruit is excellent and saves much cooking. Discard rich pastries, cakes, desserts, and the other dishes prepared to tempt the appetite. Eat fewer kinds of food at one meal and eat with thanksgiving. I find it. There are people who have diseases today who are sick, and yet they lived a very strict health reform principles in their life. And I wondered what seems to be the problem. And it's amazing. This is one of the major problems. It says here, eat with thanksgiving. If you come to the table full of luscious good food, and you are there murmuring and complaining, that food will not be helpful for you. You are destroying the principles of health reform. So make sure that we eat with thanksgiving. Volume 6, page 373-374. Volume 6, 373-374. There are many now under the shadow of death who have prepared to do a work for the Master, but who have not felt that a sacred obligation rested upon them to observe the laws of health. The laws of the physical system are indeed the laws of God, but this fact seems to have been forgotten. Some have limited themselves to a diet that cannot sustain them in health. They have not provided nourishing food to take the place of injurious articles, and they have not considered that tact and ingenuity must be exercised in preparing food in the most healthful manner. The system must be properly nourished in order to perform its work. It is customary to health reform after cutting off the great variety of unwholesome dishes to go to the opposite, opposite extreme, reducing the quantity and quality of food to a low standard. Instead of health reform, this is health deform. I remember as a child some individuals who got very excited on health reform. And they gave up milk and eggs and all these things and they were advocating that. And that was good. But they did it prematurely. They did not understand how to live on a diet like that. And pretty soon they got severely sick. They went to the doctor and the doctor told them, the only thing for you to do to help yourself get well is to eat meat. And they said, well, we must get healthy, so they ate meat. And unfortunately, later on, people remember that, and that was destructive to the progress of health reform. So let's make sure we do not do that. When we take a stand on something, let us take an educated stand. Let us understand what we are doing and then move from principle. Now there are some important points that refer to the future. In our next video we will go a little bit more into these points, but I want to at least uh, incorporate some of them here in this study. Medical Ministry, page 281. We shall soon reach a time when we must understand the meaning of a simple diet. The time is not far hence when we shall be obliged to adopt a diet very different from our present diet. So what's going to happen? There's a time coming soon we'll be required to change our diet. This was written back again in 1905. Volume 6, page 372. Volume 6, page 372. Our habits of eating and drinking show whether we are of the world or among the number whom the Lord by His mighty cleaver of truth has separated from the world. These are His peculiar people zealous of good works. Who are God's peculiar people? Those who are eating and drinking in accordance to the principles of health reform. So our habits of eating and drinking show whether we are in the world or whether we are among God's peculiar people. Volume 6, page 327. What will happen when the third angel's message is really accepted among us as a people? What will happen? Volume 6, 327. The gospel of health 
has able advocates. But their work has been made very hard because so many ministers, presidents of conferences, and others in positions of influence have failed to give the question of health reform its proper attention. That's why the movement was not going on fast enough. They have not recognized it in its relation to the work of the message as the right arm of the body. What is health reform? It is the right arm of the body. While very little respect has been shown in this department by many of the people and by some of the ministers, the Lord has shown His regard for it by giving it abundant prosperity. When properly conducted, the health work is an entering wedge, making a way for other truths to reach the heart. Now listen to this next sentence. When the third angel's message is received in its fullness, health reform will be given its place in the councils of the conference, in the work of the church, in the home, at the table, and in all the household arrangements. Then the right arm will serve and protect the body. If health reform is not being clearly accepted like this by us as a people, what does it mean? It means that we have not accepted the third angel's message in its fullness. Are we teaching the third angel's message or are we not? And what will happen to us, what will happen among the people if the health message is given properly? Volume 6, page 111. Volume 6 page 111. It is often this very paragraph that, or what this paragraph talks about, that gives people fear to present this message properly. Volume 6, page 111. If the work of temperance were carried forward by us as it was begun 30 years ago, if at our camp meetings we presented before the people the evils of intemperance in eating and drinking, and especially the e evil of liquor drinking, if these things were presented in connection with the evidences of Christ's soon coming, there would be a shaking among the people. What will it cause? It will cause a shaking among the people. You see, when this message is presented, people make decisions. And what will happen to those who refuse to change? Council on Diet and Foods, 382. Councils on Diet and Foods, 382. Many who are now only half converted on the question of meat eating will go from God's people to walk no more with them. What will happen? Those who have the pot of manna, they will continue going on the upward journey. But those who refuse the pot of manna, what will happen with them? They're only half converted on it. They will walk no more together with God's people. And for this reason, this is a prophecy that was given, I believe, in 1884, found in Councils on Diet and Foods, page 82. Councils on Diet and Foods, page 82. If meat is discarded, if the taste is not educated in that direction, if a liking for fruits and grains is encouraged, it will soon be, as God designed it should be, no meat will be used by God's people. And this is speaking as a people, not just merely as individuals. Manuscript Releases, Volume 13, page 339. Manuscript Releases, Volume 13, page 339. This is the message of warning where to give to the world. In this work we should employ all our energies. The sins which existed in Noah's day exist now. And God calls upon His ministers to carry forward a work of decided reform. God is calling upon the ministry to take action, to make a decision, a decision for the work of decided reform. He is seeking to lead His people to a higher plane of action. Let the church arise and shine. Let every family practice self-denial, doing all they can to improve their own condition. 
Those who are truly on the Lord's side will be self-denying and self-sacrificing. They will eat and drink to the glory of God, refusing to corrupt soul and body by intemperance. Then the condition of the church will testify that her light has not been removed. But if church members do not act the part God has assigned them, the movement of health reform will go on without them, and it will be seen that God has removed their candlestick out of its place. What will happen? What will happen if the church members do not do the work that was assigned them? The movement of health reform will go on without them. You see, the message of truth we will go on with you and with me or without you and me. The message will go forward. But woe unto us if it goes on without us. Because it says here it will be seen that the candlestick is removed from its place. So I have a question. Do you want to have the candlestick to move with you? Do you want the candlestick to be inside your church? Then what must happen with the issue of health reform? But if church members do not act the part God has assigned them, the movement of health reform will go on without them, and it will be seen that God has removed their candlestick out of its place. Those who refuse to receive and practice the light will be left in the background. That's right. If we refuse to receive the light of health reform, we'll be left in the background, and God's people, who are His peculiar treasure, who are bearing His ark, they will go forward in the message of truth. Now, is it really necessary for us to be temperate? We talk about the law of God. What relationship does this temperance have with the law of God? Volume 2, Selected Messages, page 415 to 416. Volume 2, Selected Messages, 415 to 416. The stomach must have its regular periods of labor and rest. Hence, eating irregularly and between meals is a most pernicious violation of the laws of health. Is what? A most pernicious violation of the laws of health. Why? Volume 1 Bible Commentary, page 1105. Volume 1 Bible Commentary, page 1105. In the Ten Commandments, God has laid down the laws of His kingdom. Any violation of the laws of nature is a violation of the law of God. So if we're violating the laws of nature, it is violating what? It is violating God's law. Volume 4, Testing for the Church, page 409. Volume 4, page 409. The reason why many of our ministers complain of sickness is that they fail to take sufficient exercise and indulge in overeating. They do not realize that such a course endangers the strongest constitution. Those who, like yourself, are sluggish in temperament should eat very sparingly and not shun physical taxation. Many of our ministers are digging their graves with their teeth. The system in taking care of the burden placed upon the digestive organs suffers and a severe draft is made upon the brain. For every offense committed against the laws of health, the transgressor must pay the penalty in his own body. Volume 3, page 150. Volume 3, page 150. It is a terrible sin to abuse the health that God has given us. For every abuse of health enfeebles us for life and makes us losers, even if we gain any amount of education. Healthful Living, page 20. Healthful Living, page 20. Every law governing the human machinery is to be considered just as truly divine in origin and in character and in importance as the Word of God. I want to read this one again. Every law governing the human machinery is to be considered just as truly divine in or origin, in character, and in importance as the Word of God. Every careless action, any abuse put upon the wonderful mechanism by disregarding His specified laws of the human habitation is a violation of God's law. This law embraces the treatment of the entire being. 
we studied earlier about the experience of the Israelites and how they rejected the pot of manna and rejected a non-flesh diet. Volume 1, page 609, applies that to our own time. Volume 1, page 609. I was pointed back to ancient Israel, but two of the adults of the vast army that left Egypt entered the land of Canaan. Their dead bodies were strewn in the wilderness because of their transgressions. Modern Israel are in greater danger of forgetting God and being led into idolatry than were his ancient people. What does it say here? It says that modern Israel is in what? Is in greater danger than they were. And this maybe explains why we are here well over 150 years still in this wilderness sojourn. And why was it? Why was it that it was so difficult for them? Patriarchs and Prophets 292 to 293. Patriarchs and Prophets 292 to 293. Speaking again about Israel, they forgot their bitter service in Egypt. They forgot the goodness and power of God displayed in their behalf in their deliverance from bondage. They forgot how their children had been spared when the destroying angels slew all the firstborn of Egypt. They forgot the grand exhibition of divine power at the Red Sea. They forgot that while they had crossed safely in the path that had been opened for them, the armies of their enemies attempting to follow them had been overwhelmed by the waters of the sea. They saw and felt only their present inconveniences and trials, and instead of saying, God has done great things for us, whereas we were slaves, He is making of us a great nation, they talked of the hardness of the way and wondered when their weary pilgrimage would end. So what happened? Oh, it says here, as they were walking on their journey, what did they do? They said, oh, this is too hard. They kept talking, this is such a difficult road. This reformation process is so hard. And the more they talked about it, the more they were convinced it was hard. And they thought, man, when are we going to end? When is this journey going to be over? And this is what caused their problems. Volume 1, Spirit of Prophecy, page 223. Volume 1, Spirit of Prophecy, page 223. The unbelief and murmurings of the children of Israel illustrate the people of God now upon the earth. What does it do? It illustrates God's people on the earth right now. Are you murmuring? Am I murmuring? Brethren, we had better learn to understand the privileges that God has given to us. His message was not given to burden us. It was given to be a blessing to us. Patriarchs and Prophets 294. Patriarchs and Prophets 294. Do we well to be thus unbelieving? Why should we be ungrateful and distrustful? Jesus is our friend. All heaven is interested in our welfare and our anxiety and fear grieve the Holy Spirit of God. That's what it does. Our grumbling and complaining, we're actually grieving the Holy Spirit. Medical Ministry 277. Medical Ministry 277. But although they had a plain, thus saith the Lord, they murmured and wept and murmured and complained until the Lord was wroth with them because they were so determined to have the flesh of dead animals, He gave them the very diet He had withheld from them. They were so insistent, we must have this flesh food. He says, okay, finally, have it. And look at the results of Israel today. So the question comes to us, why are we still here? Where are we here? Not 40 years, not 140 years, but 150 and, and growing years. Why? Evangelism, page 696. Evangelism, 696. For 40 years, did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan? The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into heaven of Canaan. The what? The same sins. And among those sins was this whole issue of non-flesh diet. Among those sins was the desire to eat meat. And those sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel. So why are we not in heaven today? Why are we not in the promised land? Is this one of them? 
Yes, this is one of those sins. And if we want to hurry up and go in and possess the land, let's not blame God. And let's not blame our pioneers either. Look, our forefathers have had their problems. You look at all their experiences, yes, they have failed. But what are we doing today? Are we continuing that failure? Or shall we make a change today and go up and possess the land? You see, Councils on Health 222. Councils on Health 222. Yes, we are God's property. And the path of obedience to nature's laws is the direct path to heaven. <laughs> you want to go to heaven? You want to go the direct path or you want to wander around? The direct path to heaven is found in obedience to nature's laws. Selected Messages, Book 2, 417. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 417. The first great evil was intemperance in eating and drinking. Men and women have made themselves slaves to appetite. The first what? The first great dead weight? No, no. The first great evil was intemperance in eating and drinking. Volume 4, page 417. Volume 4, page 417. Excessive indulgence in eating, drinking, sleeping, and seeing is sin. Notice these points. Excessive indulgence in what? In eating, in drinking, in sleeping. Yes, excessive indulgence in sleeping is a sin. And excessive indulgence in seeing what we are looking at is a sin. Education 99 to 100. Education 99 to 100. To transgress His law, physical, mental, or moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe to introduce disorder, anarchy, and ruin. Healthful Living, page 21. Healthful Living, page 21. The laws governing the physical nature are as truly divine in their origin and character as the law of the Ten Commandments. Equal. That's right. The pot of manna is in parity with the law of God. They are the same. The laws governing the physical nature are as truly divine in their origin and character as the law of the Ten Commandments. Next paragraph. It is just as much a sin to violate the laws of our being as to break one of the Ten Commandments, for we cannot do either without breaking God's law. Next paragraph. The human being who is careless and reckless of the habits and practices that concern his physical life and health sins against God. And next one. A violation of these laws is a violation of the immutable law of God and the penalty will surely follow. If you take your life instantly, suicide, do you think you're going to make it to the kingdom of God? We recognize, no, that will not happen. But what happens if we take our life gradually? Solemn Appeal, page 26 to 27. To take one's life instantly is no greater sin in the sight of heaven than to destroy it gradually but surely. Persons who bring upon themselves sure decay by wrongdoing will suffer the penalty here and without a thorough repentance will not be admitted into heaven hereafter any more than the one who destroys life instantly. That's right. So, the only advantage is that if one destroys their life instantly, there is no repentance possible. But here, if we are destroying our life little by little, and we do not repent, we will not find admittance into the heaven hereafter. We're not going there. So the question is, are you on your way to Canaan, or are you on your way back to Egypt? In the General Conference Bulletin, of 1903, page 86 to 87. You also find it in the volume 5 of the Ellen G. White biography, page 249. Ellen G. White biography, 249. 
It talks about the experience of Dr. John Harvey Kellogg and why was it what happened to him. It says, God does not endorse the efforts put forth by different ones to make the work of Dr. Kellogg as hard as possible in order to build themselves up. God gave the light on health reform. And those who rejected it, rejected God. So if you reject the light of health reform, you are not rejecting me. No. You are not rejecting the teachings of the reform movement. No. You're rejecting whom? The one who originated this light, which is God. Let me read it again. God gave the light on health reform, and those who rejected it, rejected God. I would like to read a few statements in conclusion. The first one is in Councils to Parents, Teachers and Students, page 295. Council to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 295. The importance of caring for the health should be taught as a Bible requirement. So, when we talk about our health and taking care of our health, how should we teach it? As an option? No. But as what? As a Bible requirement. Perfect obedience to God's commands calls for conformity to the laws of the being. The science of education includes a f as full a knowledge of physiology as can be obtained. No one can properly understand his obligations to God unless he understands clearly his obligations to himself as God's property. He who remains in sinful ignorance of the laws of life and health or who willfully violates these laws sins against God. God. Christ Object Lessons 347 to 348. Transgression of physical law is transgression of the moral law. For God is as truly the author of physical law as He is the author of the moral law. His law is written with His own finger upon every nerve every muscle, every faculty which has been entrusted to man, and every misuse of any part of our organism is a violation of that law. We read in the beginning of this tape from volume 5, page 77. I want to read it once again. The patience of God has an object, but you are defeating it. He is allowing a state of things to come that you would fain see counteracted by and by, but it will be too late. God commanded Elijah to anoint the cruel and deceitful Hazael king over Syria, that he might be a scourge to idolatrous Israel. Who knows whether God will not give you up to the deceptions you love? Who knows but that the preachers who are faithful, firm, and true may be the last who shall offer the gospel of peace to our unthankful churches? It may be that the destroyers are already training under the hand of Satan and only wait the departure of a few more standard bearers to take their places. And with the voice of the false prophet cry, Peace, peace, when the Lord had not spoken peace. I seldom weep, but now I find my eyes blinded with tears. They are falling upon my paper as I write. It may be that ere long all prophesying among us will be at an end and the voice which has stirred up people may no longer disturb their carnal slumbers. When God shall work His strange work on earth. When holy hands bear the ark no longer, woe will be upon the people. Yes, there is a woe placed upon the people when holy hands bear the ark no longer. When the pot of manna is no longer borne by His people, woe will be upon the people. But if one people reject it, God has given a prophecy. Once again, Testimonies of Ministers, page 411. Satan has laid every measure possible that nothing shall come among us as a people to reprove and rebuke us and exhort us to put away our errors. But praise the Lord for this. But there is a people who will bear the ark of God. God will always have a people 
Some will go out from among us who will bear the ark no longer, but these cannot make walls to obstruct the truth, for it will go onward and upward to the end. In the past, God has raised up men, and He still has men of opportunity waiting, prepared to do His bidding. Men who will go through restrictions which are only as walls dubbed with untempered mortar. When God puts His Spirit upon men, they will work. They will proclaim the word of the Lord. They will lift up their voice like a trumpet. The truth will not be diminished or lose its power in their hands. They will show the people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. God, our God, our Heavenly Father, will have a people who will bear the ark of God. The question is, are you one of those people? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Consider the lilies, consider the lilies. They toil not, neither do they spin. They toil not, they toil not, they toil not, neither do they spin. Which today is in the field, which today is in the field. How much more will we quote? How much more will we quote? You're ye of little faith. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's pleasure to give you. Consider the lilies, consider the lilies, they toil not, neither do they spin.